This is the second part of the long two-part video lecture titled The Madness in Bada Shonran's Paintings with the title Madness in quotation marks because I want to make it clear that I'm not pretending to solve the question of how much this great artist was really mad or crazy or how far he was only pretending madness to escape political dangers and for other reasons. The first part of this lecture was based on a paper that I presented at a great symposium on the artist held at his birthplace, Nanchang, in 1988. The second part will be, uh, devoted in some, will be derived in some part from a lecture that I gave at Yale University in January of 1991, uh, while a great exhibition of Bada Shonran's paintings was on show there, and while I was giving a graduate seminar on the artist. In it, I discuss such problems as Bada's possible knowledge of Chan or Zen painting as it had been produced back in the Sungyuan period, and some ways in which the changes in his painting style fit into what we know about his biography, the events of his life. So now here we go on to part two. First image, please. At the left is a portrait of Bada Shanran, whose original name was probably Zhu Da. I discussed his parentage and his names briefly in the earlier lecture. This portrait was done in 1674, when he was 48 and it bears inscriptions by Bada himself and others that are important for reconstructing his early life. There are lots of problems associated with Bada's life and his writings and paintings, but they are best discussed in learned papers and other kinds of writings, not in this video lecture form. The basic source of information and in paintings you should begin with is the exhibition catalog. Wang Fang Yu and Richard Bernhardt Master of the Lotus Garden, The Life and Art of Bada Shanran, 1626 to 1705. Uh, New Haven and London, Yale University Press, 1991. Okay. At right is the portrait sculpture of Bada, done in recent times based on this pictorial portrait, puts a lot of imagination, and set up in the Qingyun Pu, the Dallas Temple Complex outside Nanchang where Bada may have lived. That's very controversial. Next. I began my Yale lecture with a consideration of the big question of what Bada Shanran kind of known about what we call Chan or Zen painting. We know it now, as I've emphasized repeatedly, only from works preserved in Japan, since virtually none seem to have survived in China. But I built a case for Bada's being able to see scroll paintings like the two by Mu Qi, of which early copies survive in China, uh, that the originals of these, that is, probably passed down through Chan and other Buddhist monasteries, a separate transmission that wasn't noted in the Chinese records on painting. This, you may remember, is one of two copies after Mu Qi's works, probably done in the Yuan or early Ming, and still kept in China in the Palace Museum collection. The series of images of fruits and vegetables can be matched up with those in similar scrolls done by Bada Shanran in his earliest period when he was a Buddhist monk. Here is one of Bada Shanran's scrolls, not one of the very early ones, I don't have images of those, but a later one when he was using the Bada Shanran name and a fully developed style. The subjects are similar, the spacing, the endings, of which I'll speak in a moment. That these images of plants had been painted by other artists during the interim, artists such as Shunzhou, Chunshun, or Chun Daofu, and Xu Wei. I show with detailed comparisons in another lecture of mine, the one titled Continuations of Chan Painting into Ming Qing and the Prevalence of Type Images, published in Archives of Asian Art Number no. 50 for 1997-98. Next. Similarities in the endings of Mu Qi's and Bada's hand scrolls are too great for chance. He must have known something like the original of Mu Qi's scroll, of which we now have only the copy. The original could even have been transmitted through Buddhist channels until Bada's time, as I say, so that he could see it. One dreams of finding original Mu Qi paintings in Chan monasteries in China. None, to my knowledge, has ever turned up there. Muchi paints two strongly characterized minor birds on an earth slope, one of them especially, seen in this detail, exhibiting a high degree of 
human-like awareness, as if charged with some malicious feelings. Minor birds really do appear to strike poses and turn their heads in ways that suggest unbird-like feelings. Next. Here is the ending of one of Bada's hand scrolls with two minor birds on an earth slope, one turning around to look backward with a malevolent look, the other peering upward into the lotus plant. They are, that is, taking part in the strangely human-like adopting of expressive postures that Bada's birds exhibit. Next. Here again, to remind you of images shown in the first part of this lecture, are two of Bada's minor birds, or pairs of them. They make up a big part of his private iconography. Next. But, there was, but was there also a Chan painting precedent for this use of natural creatures to arouse human-like feelings? I showed in the previous lecture, and in one of the PRV lectures, uh, this painting preserved in Japan and attributed to Muchi, representing a minor bird perched on the sloping trunk of a pine tree and seeming to turn and look over its shoulder. Such seeming correspondences across the centuries and across wide geographical spaces can only make us wonder about transmission and survivals that can't be clearly established with the paintings that we have but are suggested if we put together the right ones and ask the right questions of them. I can't elaborate on that observation in this lecture, and I can only suggest that anyone seriously interested in this big question read my Yale lecture on Bada, which is included on my website as CLP 185, and also my Continuations of Chan painting article I mentioned earlier. In these, I make much more bold and specific suggestions than I can make here and illustrate here. Next. Let me show, however, in quick succession, a selection of paintings and details from paintings brought back from my Sogenga lecture near the end of our first series to remind you of some typical characteristics of Chan painting that might well have inspired Bada Shanran four centuries later in examples passed down in China, as these were in Japan, but now not to be seen there. Brushwork that departed radically from what was acceptable among the scholar-amateur Confucian literati. Birds and animals used for enigmatic expressions that somehow related to human situations and feelings. Rough and splashy areas of ink that scorned the structural function that such areas played in more disciplined kinds of painting. These can persuade us, I think, that although Bada could not have known these particular paintings, which were in Japan, he could have seen similar paintings that had been transmitted, as I say, in a Buddhist temple complex, uh, or context, I mean, and so escape being recorded in the literati compilations that we depend on for our knowledge of collectible Chinese painting over the centuries. This is speculation, to be sure, but as I've emphasized already, some of the correspondences are too close to be accounted for as coincidental. I offer this observation, like so many others, to young scholars in our field in the hope, or rather faint hope maybe, that they will be taken up and followed up by others. Next. Let me run quickly through some early and middle period work by Bada Shanran without trying to date them precisely. In my seminar, as I say, I tried with my students to work out a detailed chronology for Bada's paintings and the changes in style, format, and subject that they exhibited. I would never attempt that now. The images are too dispersed and unlabeled, and my old head will no longer hold such large and detailed programs. So I'll simply show a series of Bada paintings that precede his Greek period of the early 1690s. Paintings of geese and reeds, or geese and other settings, had been painted by Chan or Zen artists from the late Song on. We can recall the example in Mu Chi's Xiaoshang series, The Eight Views of the Xiaoshang, as well as others. Next. The painting on the left is in the study collection of the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing, and it represents the most conservative side of Bada's art in both its subject and its style. Paintings of cranes and pines were always in demand for birthdays and other presentations because of their auspicious symbolism of longevity and uprightness. 
Even Bada Shanran was not immune to the call of the marketplace, and he responded to it as other artists did. Next. This striking painting of an old plum tree, still putting forth a few leaves and blossoms, he painted in 1682, still relatively early in his painting career. In my Yale lecture, I said of it, quote, The years after 1679 to 80, following his worst bout of derangement, or enactment of it, are crucial to our understanding of how Bada arrived at the greatness of his later works. We can observe him, determined now to make his way as a painter, not only enlarging his repertory of imagery, but also mastering expressive devices that deepen the power and poignancy of his paintings. Gestural is the key element in some of them. One reads the image of this old tree, that is, as if it were striking a human posture, making a human gesture, its branches as if stretching arms outward, but as if maimed, crippled, a broken trunk thin branches, end quote. Those are strong words, but I still think they are appropriate for this period of Bada's life. Next. From this relatively early period comes an album that was always a special favorite of mine. But now, alas, my images of the leaves of it are mixed with leaves from other albums. So let me show leaves from what must be several albums of different periods without trying to straighten them out just as striking examples of Bada's middle period works, which I would almost be ready to term expressionist. Here are two that I showed before, images of a rabbit and of a cat. Cat lovers, who are themselves a special breed within the human species, will have strong opinions about whether the picture captures perceptively real habits of a cat, its way of crouching and looking upward with wide eyes. The rest of us can see it as a strongly distorted image of the animal. Next. The picture of a fish at left is from an album bought by the Freer Gallery in 1955, while I was a curator there, a middle period work as I recall. And the one at right is from another album also bought by the Freer in 1991. Maybe another version of the same? Question mark. A member of the Freer curatorial staff has, as I mentioned before, devoted a big part of his career to correcting my mistakes as he sees them, and he may have felt that the one I took part in choosing before was a fake. This is only speculation, anyway. These are both from albums in the Freer, bought at different periods. Next. A leaf depicting shrimps, or prawns, which were in more recent times to become a favorite subject of Chi Baisher. Recent Chinese artists have been very familiar with the paintings of both Shi Tao and Bada Shanran, and have adopted a lot of motifs and features of style from them, as well as from the modern Japanese master Tessai. I'll bring out those relationships in another lecture, one on recent Guohua, or so-called traditional artists in China, that is, those who didn't follow the international trends, what used to be called the avant-garde. The leaves that I'm showing, this and several that follow, are from an album dated 1683, an album with, le with leaves that I characterized in my talk as raw, harsh, shocking. The brushwork doesn't yet have the fluency and the ma mastery that he would develop later in the 1690s. Another representing crabs, another favorite subject of Chi Baisher and other recent painters. In my Yale lecture, I, ref I referred to this leaf as depicting copulating crabs. <laughs> I don't know how I knew that, or, or I can't see it now anyway, what they're doing. Uh, maybe copulating. These leaves are slightly later in date, I think, than the album that Wen Fong bought for the Princeton Art Museum, which he and others date by style and the signature used to around 1682-3. to three. Next. This one, representing what I take to be a cock and hen with chicks, continue, continuing in its odd way the old Chinese artist practice of depicting family scenes in the animal kingdom. We saw a Yuan painting of dogs and puppies in our Hikkoen lecture. This one and the previous one, representing crabs, definitely come from the middle period album that I was referring to, which I knew only from a reproduction album published long ago in Shanghai. Next. A strange fish, looking not so much like a live fish swimming in the water, as a dead fish ready to cook and eat. 
The Yangzhou master Li Shan, working in the following century, was to make a specialty of vegetables and other produce seen in the marketplace. Bada anticipates him here, or perhaps better to say that Li Shan knew the paintings of Bada Shanran, the Yangzhou master generally follow on while diluting somewhat the achievements of the great early Qing individualist masters. Next. And here is the leaf that I've been saving for last, one of my favorites, a truly amazing picture of vegetables laid out as if in the market stall or on the kitchen counter ready to be prepared for eating. Leaving aside the mundane subject and the date, he signs as Bada Shanran, but it's still in the strikingly abstract middle period style, and it belongs, I think, to the 1683 album. Leaving these aside, look at it as a piece of proto-cubist painting, the rough brushing in of the large root vegetable, some variety of what the Japanese call daikon, daikon, a kind of turnip or a large radish, and at right the twisting geometricized form of the thinner white one that's laid horizontal from the left with its leafy top painted in paler ink and placed behind the big one at right, and some kind of rounded vegetable hanging from its leafy stalk behind them all, all treated in Bada's new blunt brushwork and at the same time given volume. What is there so sophisticatedly abstracted as this anywhere in world art before the 20th century West? Question mark. Ha. Ah. Again, I can only ask you to join me in marveling at the precocity, the art consciousness, the sheer brilliance of this artist and of the tradition he belongs to and is playing against. I want to go on talking for a long time about this one just to keep it on the screen and make you gaze at it, but I've pretty much exhausted what I can say about it. It all but strikes me speechless, and we have to go on. Next. I turn now to a series of album leaves belonging mostly to two great albums that Bada painted in 1694. One is the Anwan album, called that after a term he uses in his inscription on it, former Sumitomo collection, still in the Sumitomo Museum, housed now in their old residence in Kyoto. I saw it first at the home of the collector Sumitomo Kanichi in Oiso. He was one of two brothers and gave up his position, turning it over to his younger brother, as the head of the Zaibatsu, or the family financial industrial conglomerate, the, the Sumitomo Zaibatsu, to live in reclusion, marry his love, a former geisha, as I remember, and collect Chinese paintings. I visited him with Shimada during my Fulbright year, and later returned to photograph paintings for my scarab book. That's a whole story in itself, and apparently one that's largely forgotten, as I find when I try to Google Sumitomo Kanichi and find nothing. The other 1694 album, very similar in size and style, is in the Shanghai Museum. I'll show leaves from both without trying to distinguish them. Next. This is the leaf from the Sumitomo album that I published in my Skira book photographed when I went with Henry Bevel to do photographing of that Oiso house. That's a story in itself, as I say, but not one that I'll tell now. The two little birds, each standing on one leg, one on a rock, the other on a small tree, seem endowed with more human-like consciousness than real birds usually display. The seeming freedom of brush and ink belies the complete control that Bada has by now attained over just how the brush tip separates for rough brush effects, how the ink suffuses to suggest the fuzzy edges of plumage, how the tension of the tree trunk and the sheer bulk of the rock differ from the organic life of the birds. Next, please. This leaf portraying a pair of minor birds I've shown already, but bring back as a notable member of this great 1694 series. One of the birds appears to sleep, the other lowers and turns its head to reveal both of its bulging eyes. And again, the wetness and density of the ink, the movements of the brush, are as completely controlled as any of the highly disciplined landscape paintings by Dung Chi Chang or one of the orthodox masters, and are turned to far more individual and compelling representational purposes. We are seeing a great master at the height of his power, 
while playing the role of madman. Uh, what a great contrast this presents with the easy eccentricities and the technical ineptitude of so many of our own would-be crazy artists. But this isn't the place to elaborate on that observation, which for me is deeply felt. Next. I can go through other leaves more quickly, having said something of what I want to about these albums in general. This leaf represents what I take to be two puppies, although the dark form behind the nearer white one is ambiguous. That would seem to be a tail protruding leftward. The inscription may well provide a clue, but I can't easily read it, so I leave the matter open. Next. Next, two leaves portraying single fish, isolated in spaces that we must read as water. This one looks upward, as, of, as so many of Bada's creatures do. One of the Bada interpreters pointed out that looking upward had been a way of expressing political dissent with the ruling power in early times. Maybe that has something to do with why Bada's creatures do it, but it's more than that. Here, too, the inscription must help us in interpreting these enigmatic images, but you'll have to do your reading and published writings on Bada for that. Another with a smaller fish looking more comfortable and unaware of its watery habitat. As I pointed out earlier, birds and fish both represent a kind of freedom of movement in three dimensions that's denied to us land-based animals. Next. A bird standing on one leg and looking upward. Here the bird seems as if menaced by the weight of the rock above it, even though we know that the rock is solidly based. I spoke about this relationship of creatures and their settings in the early part of this lecture on the seeming expressions of madness, quote, madness, in Bada Sanran's paintings. The rendering of the rock in diagonal broken strokes seems to give it a leftward push that the immobility of the bird and its stare somehow counter. Next. I want to shift emphasis a bit from image or representation to execution and show some pictures that use a device that Bata favored in his late period. Connecting parts of his image, or separate areas of his composition, with long, broad brushstrokes. These long strokes are so characteristic that I remember C.C. C. Wong telling me that he didn't need to see more than a few inches of one of them to determine whether or not it was a genuine work by Bata Shanran. The subtle bending or curving of the stroke the way it can turn rough with a broken brush passage without losing its momentum. Its sense of deliberate, slow power is indeed highly distinctive. I can't think of another artist who does it with this individuality and power. Next. So I'll show a few more of his paintings that are composed this way as examples. Here is one leaf with a bird on a broken lotus stalk with another stalk curving behind it and ending in a leaf. The shorter one is blunt and allows some fabi or flying white within the stroke. The longer one, ending with the leaf and so bearing its weight, as indeed does the other one, the weight of the bird, is one of Bada's long, subtly curving brushstrokes of the kind that no one else does quite the same. This is especially true of the bend in the stroke just to the left and below the bird, which is especially characterizing. One need see no more to identify it as made by Bada. And no, this doesn't prove that painting and calligraphy are a single art, as I hear some misguided partisans of that wrong belief immediately proclaiming. The representational function of the stroke, the things that it bears, the bird or the lotus leaf, are an integral part of our experience of it, part of a picture, and so cannot be equated with the strokes in calligraphy. Drawings and writing in European art and culture are sometimes made with the same kind of pen or pencil, but nobody there talks about how that makes them into a single art. They aren't in either place. Writing a script, characters arranged in rows and conveying words, while painting is producing images, pictures, and never the twain shall meet. All right, enough of that. Next, please. Bada will allow the moving brush to divide a bit and leave streaks of white within the stroke. He will raise the brush so that the stroke is not completely continuous, and the energy or the momentum of the stroke suffices to establish it as, to establish it as representing a thing, 
a stalk with thickness and tensile strength. His old habit of using lines to divide the picture space into shapes persists in some of these later works, but the shapes are no longer so angular or so clearly divided. Next. No painting by Bada can better exemplify all that I've been talking about than this one in the Sumitomo album, I think, and representing lotus stalks and leaves, a favorite subject of his. All the old symbolic values of the lotus, purity rising above mud, Buddhist values, and so on, are still there for Chinese viewers. But his representations are like no others. The blossoms are sometimes, as here, so concealed by the leaves that one glimpses only parts of a few petals through the gaps between the leaves. And the lower stalk, the way it bends, the way Bada has inked his brush unevenly so that one edge of the stroke is darker than the other. These are exemplified supremely here. I remember, let me say again, looking at just this leaf or an image of it with Cixi Wang and his saying that he need only see a section of that stroke to identify the artist and to identify it as belonging to a genuine work of the artist. No one else could have made the stroke in just that way. Next. Another leaf of flowers with another odd stalk with buds at the ends, and below part of a blossom seen through the gap between leaves. Here I would call your attention to the oddly written date above his signature. It is a date written in a cryptic script that looks rather like a dragon. I remember the arguments of Bada specialists about how to read these dates. I could never participate in them because they required knowledge that I didn't have. You'll have to read the Bada literature for enlightenment about those. Next. Another oddly composed leaf representing flowers and leaves with the stems supporting them. The one in lower right is drawn as a broad, broken brush stroke, and yet it has to sustain the weight of all the rest. The one that bends leftward and supports one blossom, twists and all but disappears. But the momentum of the stroke again gives it strength to sustain the weight. Next. A detail showing this horizontal stroke up closer, the long stem supporting heavy flowers. In gazing at Bada's paintings of this kind, we are pulled back and forth between responding to execution and responding to image. You can argue if you want to that they are inseparable, but I would separate them and go on to observe that they, they demand as much of us and provide the same kind of rewards as the experience of gazing for a long time at a painting by some Western artist who gives us great images, but also distinctive execution or brushwork, whether it's Rembrandt or Van Gogh or someone else. Next. This is a leaf from a quite different album from a later period and I show it to make the point that Bada, human after all, cannot sustain forever the power of these works from his great period. In many of the later works, he seems to be trying for the same effects and falling a bit short. I believe this is from an album owned by a friend of Cixi Wang. I never learned who he was. An album that Cixi showed me and urged me to buy, but I decided not to, because it fell short of what I most admired in Judah's works and its authenticity wasn't enough of a recommendation. That is, CC told me, this is a genuine Judah, you should buy it, but I didn't really want to. The strokes are too scattered, the energy of the brush doesn't carry over from one to another, and the result is a would-be image that doesn't cohere into an image. Next. A few more fish and bird pictures to elaborate on these points. Here it's a huge rock basic, balancing on a small base, much as a small bird in one of his paintings might stand on one foot, as if not quite stable. The rock is painted in a rich diversity of brushstroke types and ink gradations, which imparts something of its rough texture and sheer weight. The fish are presumably seen in translucent water behind it, and appear above and below. Here, it is spatial ambiguity that prevents a simple reading. Next. The upper part of another, I don't seem to have the whole image, showing just the top of the rock and the fish above it, that is beyond it, unless we are to understand that the rock is completely submerged in the water and the fish really swimming above it. That I can even put this as a question reveals the deliberate ambiguity of the image. The stroke bounding the rock 
breaks at the top, but again the momentum of the brush carries over. Next. Another bird in rock leaf, in which the bird, standing on one foot, seems to be using its tail to keep it from falling back. But of course that isn't what it's really doing. The rock is painted in broad, wet strokes, except for the bounding stroke that separates and breaks it at, at the left. Unbalance and incompletion interchange with stability and a readable image, neither being a complete or right reading of the painting. Next. Here is a hanging scroll in the Shanghai Museum, painted in 1691, in which all these contradictions and ambiguities are prominently displayed in a painting that nonetheless holds our attention as a coherent image. It's far from being my favorite Bada Shanran hanging scroll, we'll see one of those in a bit, but it's genuine and in its way compelling. Neither the rock nor the bird appears completely stable yet neither is disturbingly off-balance either. Both are, in their different ways, poised on the edge of instability. The contour drawing of the rock changes in width and in ink tonality, and breaks, leaving gaps across which the eye has to continue it by its momentum. This is the furthest thing possible from the old, linear ways of outlining a form. Still closer, the animation of the bird, its seeming excitement over something, the tension implied by its weight being sustained on the single leg, implying that it's somehow gripping the rock surface strongly enough to keep itself upright, are all dynamic qualities of the image that register on our consciousness. Next. Here, too, the network of twisting vines, painted with continuous but broken strokes, holds together the scattered leaves. Their continuous impulsion gives the whole composition its structure. The device of, hold, of hiding the grapes behind the leaves is seen again, a curious practice of Bada's for con confounding one's expectations, suggesting a desire in inanimate things to avoid one's sight, like the bird that he uh, as he wrote on another album leaf I showed before, the bird that was afraid that someone might be looking at it. Ha! <laughs> Can grapes be afraid that someone is looking at them? Only in Bada Shanran's paintings. Next. The same device is seen in this detail from a lotus painting, of which I don't seem to have the whole. The blossom is partly hidden behind broad leaves painted with brush strokes expanding outward, perhaps suggestive of vegetable growth. I ramble in talking about these paintings because they elude clearer readings, confound one's urge to accommodate them into familiar programs. Next. Now, after these scattered and incomplete visual presentations of Bada paintings, I'll show one in great detail, nine great details, in fact. It's the wonderful painting of Lotus in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, with a long inscription in which Bada tells us that it's based on a work by Xu Wei. It's a special favorite of mine that I've been leading up to. It illustrates so well just the qualities of Bada's paintings that I've been talking about at length, that I'm going to show the details without discussing them individually, instead meandering on using some notes that I took long ago while going around the big exhibition of his paintings shown at the Qingyun Pu near Nanchang while the Bada Symposium was going on. My notes and the ideas they embody were intended for inclusion much elaborated in the chapter on Bada Shanran in the book on early Qing painting, the fourth in my series that I started but never finished. So here we go. Bada, like a character in a Nabokov novel, sets up an endless series of enigmas for later people to solve. He is deliberately, systematically cryptic. And now, Bada scholars, like Hong Mung scholars, or Nabokov scholars, are busy puzzling or deciphering, trying to understand what he has left them. And they differ even on the goal toward which they are striving on whether or not his works are ultimately intelligible and will yield their meanings if they work at them long enough, or, will, or else if they will go on being unintelligible forever. What we read about how Bada in his later life communicated by gestures instead of by speech, we should realize how this corresponds in a way with the expressive impulsion of forms in his paintings. His brush gestures as well as it depicts forms, 
and the plants and animals and animals gesture to each other, pine branches, lotus stalks, and leaves. By the time of the great Sumitomo and Shanghai Museum albums, done on the same year as 1694 and very much alike, with the leaves virtually interchangeable, Bada has perfect control over his materials. He knows just how the paper will absorb, how to put on dry and wet strokes, how to control ink values. His control is not like that of the orthodox masters, but is of the same kind in the variety and the richness that it allows. That's about all for this lecture. I may do still another Bada lecture, treating his landscape paintings if I left out on this one, incorporating some more materials from the lecture I gave at Yale in 1991, and also from my seminar on Bada, and from notes for the chapter on him that I meant to write in my volume on early Qing painting. Some of what I meant to develop in those was incorporated into my paper called Continuations of Chan Painting into Ming Cheng and the Prevalence of Type Images, which was published in Archives of Asian Art, number 50, for 1997-98. So, with the recommendations that you go on to read that, if you're really interested in the large problems raised by the paintings and the career of this great artist, I close this long two-part lecture, at least for now. Yours, James Cahill, finished in the early part of January 2013.